When you die, will you be able to look back at your life and say that you lived a regret-free life? Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into retirement income. Today, we're talking with author, podcaster, and hospice doctor, Jordan Grummet, about how to live a regret-free life. Jordan, welcome to the show. Jeremy, so excited to be here with you today. You got it. Uh, I'm going to ask you about how to live a regret-free life next. But before that, tell me who you are, what you do, and why you do what you do. So my name is Jordan Grummet. I am a hospice doctor. When my father died at the age of seven, he was a doctor. I wanted to be just like him. I became a doctor and quickly burned out, realized it wasn't fulfilling me, discovered the financial independence world, realized I had enough money to quit, but then I had to decide what to do with my life. I kept the one thing about medicine I loved, which was being a hospice doctor, started doing it very part-time, about 10 hours a week. And in the meantime, I started pursuing my passions. One of them was personal finance because it was the thing that allowed me to free myself from this job I had burned out in. I started a blog and then a podcast and then eventually wrote a book when I realized that my hospice patients had a lot to say about money and life. And I was doing these podcasts with all these experts who were telling me about how to build businesses and how to get a high net worth and how to shoot for financial independence. But a lot of them couldn't answer the deeper, more important questions of why and how that makes us happier. And my hospice patients actually had a lot to say about that. Yeah, and that, that's uh, what we want to learn from from them. They're facing life altering news and life altering, you know, daily uh, things they got to deal with. So I imagine that changes their perspective. But you mentioned a phrase there, financial independence, and of course, our podcast is retirement revealed. Kind of the standard word is retirement uh, that we're using a lot. Can you just define for us what you mean by retirement? I'm sorry, uh, financial independence, and maybe compare it to retirement. I certainly can. So, and this has evolved over time. So originally for me and a lot of people, financial independence was having enough money so that you never had to work again. And there are ways to calculate this. And especially in retirement planning, you think a lot about these ways. You talk about things like safe withdrawal rates and the 25 times rule. You take how much you spend every year and multiply it by 25. Hopefully when you get to that number, that'll be enough money if it's invested wisely will then last you for 30 years. So it used to be this idea of financial independence was a net worth number that could allow you to retire and not work again. Over time, that's changed when we've realized that maybe retirement or not working is not really the goal anymore. It's actually living the life we want to live. So there are newer ways to start thinking about financial independence. For instance, there are a lot of people who start investing in things like real estate or do side hustles or create passive income. And so for those people, financial independence is making enough money every month to cover their monthly needs. Or there's people who love their jobs. So for them, financial independence might be going to work at a job you love, a job you would do even if they weren't paying you for it, but it happens to pay your bills. So I think we can look at financial independence in a lot of different ways, but ultimately my goal is that your money allows you to spend as much time as possible doing those things that are purposeful and important to you. And there's obviously several ways to do that, but that's the real goal is how do I spend my time doing things that are important, purposeful to me, things that are a good use of my time. Yeah. It's interesting. I uh, kind of came in with the, uh, the reverse negative of let's go regret free. But I think uh, what you're going to suggest is that perhaps having a purpose and fulfilling those purposes is what gets you towards that. Uh, regret-free life. And I'm thinking too of that uh, song. I'll butcher the uh, the words, but I think it's regrets. I've had a few, and I'm imagining that the people you're talking to in hospice have had a few regrets, and and yet you've learned quite a bit. So tell us, how do we live that regret-free life? You know, first thing I like to talk about something I don't talk about in the book. I've evolved in my own thinking, and so. I almost think even regret is a bad word because when we get to the end of life, we no longer have agency to change these things, right? So when you're on your deathbed, you can't go back and climb Mount Everest. It's too late. So I almost don't even want to call that regret anymore. I want to call that a disappointment. And the reason why is because you really don't have agency to change it anymore. But when we're young and healthy and we have a lot of life in front of us, then we have very much things that we consider regrets. And we probably do have agency to change those things a little bit. And I think that's what the dying really teach us is let's start thinking about these things before it's too late, when we have some agency and maybe start working on them when we're younger. And the truth of the matter is what I've evolved to think is that regret in those who have a long life ahead of them is another name for purpose. 
And so this idea that if we can take our regrets and use those to spur us into action, to do some of those purposeful things today, they no longer feel like regrets. And I think that's the real message that the dying have taught me. One that I think is really important for all of us who are ensconced in kind of the personal finance world. And we're so busy worrying about having enough money for retirement or getting to some net worth number. They remind us that we have to think about what's truly important to us, what that money is supposed to be a tool for us to achieve and start working on those things now. Yeah, there's uh love hearing all this. And when something you said might get me to change how I approach uh, a, a phrase, a, a approach life, I suppose. I, I tell my clients, you should control what you can control, protect what you can't. And I'm thinking now from what you said with regrets and agency, like, Maybe it should be control what you can control before you can't control it anymore. That's that's maybe the the line I need to to the tack I need to take right there. Yeah. Well, what we experience in hospice is when we come together as a hospice team, we try to cover someone's symptoms. We try to make sure that they have a safe place to die, whether that be home or in the hospital or a nursing home. But eventually we start talking to them about their life. And it's called the life review, where we ask them kind of what they wish they achieved and didn't achieve. What were those important moments in their life? Who are those important relationships? And if possible, if people have regrets, we try to help them have a last minute fix, right? If they lost track of someone who's important to their life, we'll try to reconnect them with that person. What I call that in the book is the deuce ex machina. It's the last minute plot twist that fixes everything. But our real goal is to not need the last minute plot twist. And that's why I think we have to start thinking about these things way earlier. Is it, It's great if we as a hospice team or your family can help you meet some of those dreams while you're on your deathbed. But how powerful would it be if we could start thinking about these things when you're nowhere near your deathbed? And, and so that's the idea, again, which comes back to what you said, is, is start looking at those regrets, those things that we can change and start acting on them now so that we don't get to a point where we can't change them anymore. Yeah, in your book, you uh, shared a really kind of um, personal, not you know, not personal to you, but just just the story of a son getting more uh, connected to his family. Do you do you mind sharing uh, briefly that uh, that that story? So I believe the story you're talking about is I had at the beginning of my hospice volunteer days. I was volunteering in the inpatient hospice at Northwestern University, and this was back in the late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, and the HIV AIDS pandemic was a real, real problem. Like We don't see that nowadays nearly as much in the United States, but back then we had lots and lots of people dying from it, and I ended up volunteering for someone who was in the inpatient unit who was getting pretty close to actively dying. And they had been estranged from their parents because they were gay. And when they came out of the closet and told their family members this, it led to a split in the relationship. This person went off and lived for the next 10 years without ever seeing their family, eventually got HIV and AIDS and was dying in the hospital. And their wish, one of his wishes, was to reconnect with his family. And our chaplain actually got on the phone, called his family who lived in the suburbs and we were in the city. And they actually came and he died with them in his room mm. next to his friends and his partner and all the people who were part of his new community. And it was exactly that, the deus ex machina. It was the last minute plot twist where his true life of friends and his partner and his life that he lived for the last 10 years came together peacefully with the first 25 years of his life. And he had some a real moment of peace, which was wonderful and uncommon. <laughs> that doesn't happen that often. So just because the pieces align correctly occasionally doesn't mean that we should rely on that by putting off the important things into the last moment. And so the deus ex machina can work, uh, but I'd rather have you put your life together in such a way that you don't need it. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that story because it uh, it gives a bit of hope, I think, for some people. And I think in your book too, the way you wrote it was, yes, this is a wonderful bringing back together, but just imagine what life would have been like if this had happened 10 years earlier of, of the missed opportunities and the, the anger and the hurt and the pain, all this stuff maybe couldn't have happened or could have been reconciled uh, much earlier. And I think a lot of people are almost waiting, like, oh, I'll just take care of this later. Um, and just the phrase of it doesn't happen that often 
right? That realization of if you're waiting for later, almost like the longer you wait, the less likely it's going to, going to happen, which is, um, it, which is good advice uh, from you. Well, and we, you know, we talk about it in all the, all the time in financial terms, we talk about how our money compounds, but what we don't talk about is how our love, our joy, and our experiences compound. So again, you take that situation and if he had made amends with them 10 years earlier, he would have had 10 years of compounding mm -hmm. in the form of joy and happiness and connection. And so he missed out on all that compounding. Uh, in the end, again, had some resolution, but think about how incredibly fulfilling all those years of compounding experiences and love and joy. Think about how many dividends would have been able to be paid yes, through those relationships. And so I love using these financial terms to describe what we're actually looking for in life, which is more love and connection ultimately. Yeah. I, I love how you use the word resolution. Cause I think, uh, especially with a book like taking stock where you're, you're talking about the dying and even just the word retirement, uh, that word retirement is kind of just talking about the close of an old chapter. It's interesting how, uh, a lot of times it's almost like we're looking forward to, or assuming like th things are just going to end, uh, whatever those things are. And you are focusing on how to bring meaning then to the present, how to bring meaning to each moment. You, you mentioned a few time hacking techniques, you call them, uh, to bring me meaning to each moment. Do you mind sharing a few of those? Sure. I mean, ultimately, one of the stresses we all have is that time is limited. We only have a certain amount of time and we can't buy or sell it. We can't trade it. We can't commoditize it. But we can try to get the most out of that time, which means doing meaningful, purposeful work in that time as much as possible. Part of that means doing some of the harder things efficiently, right? So it doesn't take up the rest of our time. So there are some kind of work hacks and some timing hacks that can really give you a little bit more space to do those things you feel are joyful. So what are some of mine? I mean, there's some easy ones, getting up early in the morning. I mean, there's no better time to do something difficult or even something you don't like doing than doing it early in the morning. Why? No one else is awake. You're at your freshest. There's no interruptions. By getting up early, you give yourself that extra hour or two to do some of those more difficult things. And it frees up the part of the day where people are around, where there are distractions and where you have a little bit less control. It allows you to do other more fulfilling things during that time. Maybe things you, you don't have to concentrate as much on. So that's one hack. Another easy one is outsourcing, right? Like I would rather work at a job that I feel so, so about and make some extra money so that I can then hire someone to clean my toilets, which I hate doing, right? So it's a trade. I'm trading something that is a medium for me. Like I don't, I don't hate it, but I don't love it, but it's work, but it makes me money. And I can use that to free myself from something I hate doing. So that's a net gain. So how can you outsource? How can you use the resources you have now to pay other people to do things you don't like doing? And then I talk a lot about something called work bursting, which I love doing, especially with my creative energy. I find, and I think this is common for most people, we produce the most in these separate short-term bursts where we do very deep thinking, right? So if you set some time aside where there are no distractions and you do your deep thinking and really hard work in an hour or two burst, and then spend the rest of the time resting in between these bursts, you actually get more accomplished. And again, you create more free time for yourself to do other things. So those are just a few simple hacks that I talk about in the book, which are ways again, because ultimately your goal is to spend as much time as you can doing the things that really fill you up, that feel purposeful. And so let's be really efficient with those things that don't necessarily fill us up. Yeah, you talked about outsourcing. I, lo I love that one personally. Uh, you refer to it more as a trade. Let me trade my uh, money for time, time for money. I think of it more of a creation of value. There are things in this world that I don't like to do that other people do. And if I take the opportunity to let others do that, like that's creating value in their lives. And meanwhile, thinking of you personally, there's probably not too many hospice doctors around. I mean, relatively speaking, the the ability to go become a hospice doctor is, is I'm going to call it rare. And so if you can personally go create your value to the world in being a hospice doctor, or you can go mow the lawn, clean the toilets, do your you know, tax preparation, whatever it is that uh, you could be doing, but is not your unique value, 
uh, you're actually kind of like destroying value from the world. If you're not doing your unique value and purpose, whatever that might be, then you're, you're somewhat taking away, like you are, you are robbing the world of your value and you're robbing someone else of their ability to create value to you, to create value to themselves, to create value to the world. So that's my, that's my take on outsourcing. Like you have a, a God given duty to outsource. That's my, that's my personal, uh, personal opinion on it. Yeah. It gets back to this idea of best at highest used, right? Use. Mm -hmm. We have certain things that we are just best at doing. Why not maximize the time we're doing those things and minimize the time we're doing things that maybe other people are very efficient and good at doing. Yeah. Uh, I just asked you about time hacking, but I'm going to talk about another uh, use of time in that according to your bio, you turned 50 this past year. How has hitting that milestone birthday, how has that affected you? So in lots of ways, nothing has changed, right? My life hasn't been internally disrupted or changed very much, but it definitely still connects me to this idea that time is passing, right? And we have a limited amount of time on this earth. And so I'm very, very thoughtful about being in the moment and and being involved in things that I feel are important or useful during that time. And so I think that's that's big for me because as I also have young kids, like I sent my first kid to college and my daughter just got a driver's license. So there are all sorts of things that are changing. My parents just moved out of my childhood home to live in a independent living. So all of these things are are big reminders that I need to practice what I preach. What I'm writing about in this book is, is very true. Time is passing and we, we have no control over that portion, but we do have control of over what activities we fulfill our days with. So I'm trying to be really thoughtful about making sure that those are important activities that feel good and purposeful to me. Yeah, that's, that's great. It's interesting how these milestone birthdays kind of focus you. And, and when we're talking to people about retirement, you're often reaching a milestone birthday, like 60 or 65 or, or 70. And it's, it's interesting when I, I haven't hit that yet myself, but when I'm uh, talking to people about that there, I never thought I would make it to this age, or I just can't imagine that I'm you know, as old as my parents, you know, of course their parents yeah. are 25 years older than them at that point in time too. So it's, uh, it's interesting, but also, um, cause, cause it's a bit of a, uh, personal, how do you view yourself, which I think the, the term of financial independence helps towards how do you view yourself better than the term of retirement? Uh, cause that can be kind of a defeating term almost sometimes. Uh, but also points to the fact that if you are at a milestone birthday, you probably want a few more milestone birthdays. Mm-hmm. And you you give a bunch of tips in your book too about how to you know increase and invest in your physical and mental health. So I'm gonna ask you, what's the number one thing if you can boil it down to that? What's the number one thing you can do to stay healthy as you age? Oh, I mean, it's hard to say number one because there's it's really a chorus of things, right? So um I think feeling engaged and purposeful in life leads to the others. So if you feel like you have a motivation for the day that you have a reason to wake up and something important to do, I think that actually then allows for you to do things like exercise and create better relationships and do all those really important things to kind of feeling human and feeling good. Um, So to me, it's purpose. I think purpose is kind of still number one is waking up each day with a sense of purpose and what I want to do that day. And I think that leads to the rest, but exercise, stress reduction, all of those things are really important to kind of just, you know, feeling at ease and relaxed and enjoying whatever amount of time you have left, whether that be decades or years or months. Yeah. I, uh, it's, it's interesting that just, um, and I think in just the, the term retirement of how a lot of times, just retiring almost just increases your mortality risk, right? Uh, perhaps losing that sense of purpose. So I, I, I see exactly why you're putting uh, purpose on there is perhaps the number one thing if you had to boil it down to one thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking re- of tactics. I've heard from other doctors, drink more water. Like just go out and drink more water seems to be a big thing. You tell me, what do you think about that? Oh, well, so first and foremost, unless the science has changed, because I'm not as busy of an active practicing doctor as I used to be, but there are no studies on water and how much is important. So I always told my patients, drink when you're thirsty and otherwise don't worry about it. So this whole <laughs> evolution of carrying around water bottles and drinking excessively, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I still have no idea where all this came from. And I don't believe there's a lot of scientific evidence for it. Um I think the retirement issue hits people a lot because they didn't do a huge amount of thinking about what felt purposeful and important in their lives. And so when they retire, instead of feeling it as this big boon, 
they actually feel like they now have to figure out who they are and what they want out of life. And that can be really, really, really stressful. Mm -hmm. And so I think that puts you at risk, right? It puts your health at risk. It puts your happiness at risk. Um, Retirement's a a funny word because ultimately what I, ultimately what I think we find is that if you do some of that purpose work before you retire, Retirement is much, much more of a soft landing as opposed to an abrupt stop. And so people who get engaged and feel purposeful in their work or the things they're doing at home or in life, instead of quitting totally, they might leave an employer and consult for a while, or they might leave employment and go to fun employment, right? Or they may find that their new hobby or their new expertise, something that they were enjoying doing, leads to some money-making possibilities. And so if we remove that hard stop of retirement and instead look at it as you're going to do some type of work your whole life, maybe at the beginning of your life, you think about that as work you do for an employer to make money. But as you get older, you do work for yourself to create happiness and joy and you provide services for yourself, whether that's doing the dishes, mowing the lawn or getting engaged in a hobby that you really enjoy. Those are all forms of work too. So work never really stops. The only thing that changes maybe is who and how you're being paid for it. And so if we can be financially intelligent enough to get to a point where we don't need someone else to pay us anymore for work, we can then just continue doing the work we like to do. So again, instead of being a hard stop, it's really a continuum of filling our lives with purposeful things. Um, Again, early in your life, you might get paid for those. Hopefully later in life, you don't need to. And then whether you get paid for them or not is not nearly as important. And when it's less abrupt like that, I think the risk to our health and the risk to our happiness and the likelihood of anxiety and depression really go down quite a bit. Yeah, I like how you said the work, doing the work we like to do. I think maybe part of this transition to retirement that is hard is is you didn't think about it ahead of time because you felt like you had to. It's like as soon as you get out of uh, retirement or you get into retirement, uh, you got rid of the have to. The have to probably wasn't there to begin with. It's just really what you're telling yourself. And you've got an exercise that I think helps you get rid of the have to, just really helps you think about this ahead of time. Tell tell me about the reverse lottery test and how do we go about uh, using that? So the reverse lottery test asks you to do exactly that. Think about how your life would change if all of a sudden your lottery ticket hit and you now had, let's say, a billion dollars, more money than you ever knew what you would do with let's take a look at your life. Let's open up your planner or your calendar or your scheduler. And let's look at what of those things that are on that calendar would you get rid of if you had more money than you needed? And that's like a really profound thing to do because let's say you're 40 or 50 and you're looking at your calendar and you realize if you won the lottery, you would get rid of almost everything on your calendar. Then you've got to look back and say, what kind of life am I living? The idea actually is to fill your calendar with things that you would do, whether you were making money or not. And so it's a really, it's a great wake up call to look at your daily activities. And if you're finding that the things you're doing are mostly money oriented, it's time to really start developing a sense of purpose to start looking at what are the things that are authentically interesting to you and how to fulfill them. Maybe you can't do it in the nine to five because you still have to work to make money, but what are you doing on your nights and weekends? Who are the people you're connecting with? What are you pursuing outside of work that's filling your precious time with something important? Because if you are not, if you are not doing it, I can promise you, you'll be one of those patients I go visit on their deathbed and you will have regrets that you never actually did or had the courage to do the things that were important to you. Yeah, I appreciate you getting out and spreading this message of having the purpose ahead of time so that you aren't filled with regrets towards the end. Uh, and at that point, like I said, is, is this appointment. Um, I also appreciate just the phrase financial independence. And maybe that's just viewing your own money as a financial independence uh, journey as opposed to, okay, I'm, I'm saving for a specific retirement. So this has been uh, incredibly helpful as we're, we're talking through these things, Jordan. I've got one more question for you. But before that, tell us what's the best way to reach out to you. 
So the easiest way to find me is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can find all about the book, Taking Stock, as well as the three places I've traditionally created content. One is a medical blog I did from about 2004 to 2018 called In My Humble Opinion. The other is a financial blog called diversify.com. And last but not least, where I spend most of my time creating content nowadays is the Earn and Invest podcast. You can find links to all three at jordangrummet.com. All right. We'll link to uh, jordangrummet.com in there as well, too. And Jordan, I like giving away books. And so the first three people who email me, it's podcast at kylefp.com. I will send out to you the book, Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. We'll have links to that, too. If you're not in the first three, then uh, then we'll have a link to Jordan's book uh, there as well, too. Excellent. Well, I've got one more uh, question for you. And that is going to be, tell us something about yourself that few people know about. And remember this podcast is ready to clean. <laughs> well, I, he, let me give you two. One, when I was a kid, I loved juggling. Right. And so I remember my brother, Andrew could juggle and he's like, you're never going to learn how to juggle unless you look at this juggling for dummies book. Right. He had juggling for dummies book that taught you how to juggle. And of course I was stubborn. So I taught myself how to juggle. And I, I even taught people at summer camp how to juggle too. Like they made me a, a, a teacher and I had my own session where I would teach other campers. So that's one. The other is when I was in residency, I fell in love with artwork and bought a bunch on eBay and realized I could get the same artwork that I saw in galleries for really, really cheap prices. So for a few years, I bought and sold artwork on the internet. And that was a lot of fun. As your first uh, side hustle, I think. You know, it was one of them. I actually, when I was a little kid, I also loved baseball cards and I bought and sold baseball cards too. So I've had a few side hustles here and there and not, not amazingly successful, but a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I was, uh, that was my, I would earn job. I would earn money from cleaning the apartment stairwell and then go uh, get paid, go and buy some baseball cards. You know, I'm 12 years old. And then I'd go get a uh, booth at the baseball card show and, and sell the, yeah. the good baseball cards. That was my... Uh, I guess my first side hustle back when I was uh, 12. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of baseball cards. Even though I don't collect anymore, I was an avid collector as a kid. Yep, oh, same here. That's awesome. Good. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Jordan. This has been been a blast as we learn about living a regret-free life. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for giving away a few books. That's really kind of you. Yeah, you, you got it. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Reveal Podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. Mm -hmm.